welcome to Funny But True, an evening of MPW storytelling, along with uh, two special guest stars. Sandra Singh Lowe is in the house. <laughs> and Shelley Berman is in the house. I'm the director of the Master of Professional Writing Program. We're a multi-genre graduate creative and professional writing program. We're entering into our 40th year this spring. And this is a program that's pretty unique. It's a program in which students can study writing for stage and screen, poetry, creative nonfiction, and um, fiction. And we also just added classes in new media. So if you want to check out the program, feel free to talk to me or to Nan Cohen, who's on our faculty, or Prince Gomobilis, who's on our faculty, or Sandra Singh Lowe, who's also on our faculty. And Shelley Berman is a lecturer emeritus, so you can also talk to Shelley, or many of our students are here in the audience as well. So I'm so thrilled that you all came out this evening to um, help us celebrate, and I just want to take uh, a couple of minutes at the top here to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. How's the mic? Do you mind? Okay. Um, and I also um, want to let you know that after the evening, we'll have a reception in the lobby. Uh, so tonight we'll hear from 10 MPW students performing excerpts from works they've developed in Prince Gomobilis' storytelling class. And the transformation of this barren lecture hall into a luminous setting for fun but true. <laughs> Is, is proof of Peter Brooks' famous declaration. I can take any empty space and call it a stage. Wait. I can take any <laughs> empty space and call it a bare stage. A man walks across this empty space while someone else is watching him, and this is all that is needed for an active theater to be engaged. Peter Brook goes on to discuss the four categories of theater, deadly, holy, rough, and immediate. And he talks about the hunger for connection that brings audiences to live theater and of the nourishment to be found here. I'm certain that tonight you'll find much imaginative sustenance on our humble, chalk, dusty stage. We want to thank East-West players for lending us this lovely curtain. <laughs> And also for donating the prize for tonight's raffle. Uh, the raffle will be held later in the evening when we'll draw a name and someone will receive two free tickets to see the Los Angeles premiere of a play at East West Players. And Prince Gomobilis will tell you more about that. Prince Gomobilis uh, plays include Big Hunk of Burn and Love, The Theory of Everything, and The. His awards include the Penn Center U.S. Literary Award for Drama, and screenwriting fellowships. He also tours around the country with musician Brandon Patton as part of the critically acclaimed storytelling, song singing, bingo playing, <laughs> comic duo, Jukebox Stories. Prince teaches here uh, at Master Professional Writing Program. Please join me in welcoming Prince Gomobilis. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Is everybody excited to be here? All right. Let me tell you, right. me tell you a little bit about the class that I've been teaching this summer. Uh, I've been teaching a class called uh, Writing and Performing Comic Monologues, and this is the culmination of that class. Today is our very last class session. Um, initially, the class wasn't actually called that. Initially, the class was called Writing and Performing Monologues. There was nothing comic about it. There was no comedy mentioned. And I was thinking about it for a while, and I thought to myself, do I really want to spend the entire summer listening to students talk about their horrible childhoods? Um, and the answer, of course, was no. Uh, so we added the word comic, and it's now uh, writing and performing comic monologues. Now, don't misunderstand. Uh, it didn't mean that the students couldn't write and, and perform stories about their horrible childhoods. It just now meant that I was able to laugh at them. Um, <laughs> And uh, uh, I think we're going to have a really fun evening tonight. Uh, the, the students have gone through an amazing transformation over the summer. Uh, some of them, that first day of class, uh, it was the first time that they'd ever gotten in front of a group of people. And 
a few of them looked like literally that they were going to have a nervous breakdown. It was it was quite uh, hilarious, actually, um, but also <laughs> but frightening for them. Uh, but over the summer, uh, I have watched them grow into uh, uh, very confident performers, and I think you're going to be very impressed at sort of the level of performance and storytelling that they're going to bring to the stage tonight. Um, so, are you, with that said, are you ready to go? Yeah. All right. So, he has agreed to be the first one on the stage to tell a story. Ladies and gentlemen, please, a warm round of applause for Josh Feldman. Hi, everybody. Good evening. But how good is it? Do you know how hard it is to date? And what's interesting to me, I'm always fascinated. I'm always fascinated by people who will meet someone or have the promise of a date, and they go, this could be the one. Let me give you a little, a little bit of context. I was at a, a Halloween party, and... Uh, I was there dressed as my uh, favorite founding father, <laughs> Groucho Marx. And um, I love Halloween parties. I love the food at, at Halloween parties. I'm standing at the food table and examining that there's, you know, devil eggs shaped like eyeballs and there's cookies shaped like bats and waxed lips and all this kind of thing. And so I'm shoving eyeballs into my face when all of a sudden, out of my peripheral vision, I sense the presence of a woman. And I look up, and that's when I see someone dressed as Sarah Palin. And I don't know what came over me, but all of a sudden, I just launched into this Groucho impression. And I said, hey, doll, how's it feel to be dressed as the devil? <laughs> and she looked at me and said, I'm dressed as Sarah Palin. Are you one of the three stooges? <laughs> I mean, it was, it was a dagger into my heart. But then it occurred to me, she's a woman, and she might be the one. So I was, I, was, I was stuck to her like glue the whole night and, and kept talking to her. And finally I asked for her number and she, this, this is great, you're going to love this, it was, it was so cute. She went, oh Jesus Christ. Uh, and I said, I said, now you sound like Sarah Palin. Um, so she gave me her number and I, I called her and I really wanted to take her somewhere special, something in some place indicative of how we met. And, Lo and behold, there was a Marx Brothers retrospective at the County Museum in the lack of uh, film series. And uh, she agreed to go, and the plan that we had established was that I was going to pick her up from her office. Now, I, I, I should tell you, she works very, very far from the museum, and I live very close. But I, I thought this was, this was great because uh, maybe after this long screening, which was a little expensive, that's fine, in a couple of movies, I thought maybe uh, she, would, she would want to stay at my place, um, which was great. So I immediately began defrosting this box of wine that I keep in my freezer for, for just such an occasion. Um, so the day of the show, I drive all the way to her office, and I get there, and I, I call her, and I say, let's do this. And she then informs me that there is this impromptu um, uh, soiree in the office for someone who is leaving. And she'll be down in 20, 25 minutes. So I'm sitting down there, parked outside of, of her office building, and I'm starting to kind of get pretty annoyed because usually when the Marx Brothers have a retrospective, I camp out the night before. And here I'm going to be late for this screening. And I kind of got pissed off. But then I remembered, she's a woman. And she might be... The one. <laughs> so finally I call up and she says she'll be right down. She comes down, gets in the car, I'm speeding away. And there was something kind of peculiar about her. I couldn't put my finger on it at first. Uh, but then I realized what it was. She was hammered. She was completely drunk. And typically, a few drinks is exactly what the doctor ordered to have your way with a woman. Uh, that's, that's, that's not a joke. My, my therapist has prescribed that if I ever want to procreate, I do have to get someone really, uh, really drunk. But in this case, it was hindering our ability to get to this screening and sit down and see the Mark So we get to the museum, I'm, I'm pulling her in like, you know, I'm taking my grandmother out of the home. I plop her down in the seat. She goes to sleep. I'm watching the Marx Brothers. Everything's great. Like 30 seconds in, she leans over and I'm the whiskey breath and she says, she says, I'm really hungry. Can we get something to eat? Okay, she's a woman, she might be the one. We get the hell out of there. We go to 
Genghis Cohen on Fairfax, and she was so ravenous that I said, you know what, let me just drop you off, go inside, order a few Chinese dishes, whatever you want, I'm sure it'll be great, we'll share, I'll park the car. I get in just in time to see three waiters wheeling trolleys of food over. She ordered 25 dishes. I'm trying to do the math in my head of how much this is, this is going to cost me, and she takes two bites and says she's done. I immediately ask for them to wrap everything up. I'm amortizing in my head how I'm going to be able to you know, pay my rent if I eat this much rice and this much beef and broccoli over, the, over this particular course of time. I go out. I give her all the bags. I say, I'll get the car. Just hold all this. I run, get the car, drive back. I get back just in time to see her giving all of the food away to a homeless person. Now, I'm, all bad. I'm fine with, with, with giving things to the homeless, but get a receipt for the tax deduction, please. <laughs> After her bout of charity, she asks me to, to take her back to her car, so I take her to her office and drive home alone. And when I went into my apartment, I was determined not to let the night end on a sour note, so I put in my DVD of of, of duck soup, and I, I thought I'd have a, a glass of wine, which wasn't completely defrosted, so I sort of chipped off a popsicle. Um, and I'm sitting on the couch, and I'm, I'm watching Groucho and licking my wine. And <laughs> I just started to feel uh, really bad, and um, started to think about, you know, dating and how difficult it is, and all of a sudden, on the sofa next to me, my cell phone lights up, and there's a text, and it said, Hey, Joel, thanks for the Stooges movie. And that's when I realized, maybe she is the one. Thanks very much. Thank you, Thank you uh, All right. It doesn't stop. It keeps on going. Ladies and gentlemen, please. Round of applause for Susan Kavinsky. That's my spot. Well, this is a terrible monologue about my horrible childhood. <laughs> no, this is about becoming a high school teacher. And in my um, first job as a high school English teacher, I was hired to take over a classroom of 11th grade inner city kids in the middle of the academic school year. It's pretty daunting that. When you walk into a classroom in February, they've already been together for six months as a cohesive unit. You're coming to them. It's their classroom. This inverts the normal power structure. <laughs> Before this, I had only been a middle school teacher. And that damn near killed me. <laughs> it turns out there's only one personality tri uh, type that actually thrives in a middle school classroom environment, and I am not that. So when I moved over to high school, I decided I would project this aura of calm, professional efficiency. I'd dress conservatively every day and maintain tight control in my classroom and do all the things in my mental image of what a good teacher would do. In fact, I clung to the role of good teacher as though it were a life raft. So we're about a month into the first unit I designed around themes of immigration in Willa Cathas, my Antonia. And the kids are about to get their reports on the pioneer of my choice. I know, right? Natalie jumps right up. In fact, she insists on going first. I'm a little suspicious because Natalie's not the eager beaver type. Natalie is a naughty girl. You know the type, tough, cool, leader of the pack. I know this type because when I was in high school, I was a naughty girl. So I know not to mess with Natalie. So I go sit in the back of the room, and Natalie takes over the teaching role in the front of the room, and she says, my report is on Deadwood Dick. <laughs> now, there's a heavy pause in the room, but not one of the 32 17-year-olds even snickers awe at that. You'd expect an explosion, laughter, jokes, comments, Whoa, she said Dick. 
Nothing. My teacher senses are tingling. They're up to something. I know it. But what? So Natalie proceeds to tell us about Nat Love, the black cowboy whose nickname happened to be Deadwood Dick and Deadpan Delivery. And everybody's listening with rapt attention. Every time Natalie says his name, she emphasizes a different word. Deadwood Dick. Deadwood Dick. Deadwood Dick. Deadwood Dick. Deadwood Dick. Does this girl even know how to use a pronoun? I think not. So, there's nothing I can say in this situation. I mean, they're all being perfectly behaved. And if I say anything right now, I'm on the wrong end of the double entendre. Ooh, Miss K got a dirty mind. <laughs> so, I pretend she isn't saying, would dick, would dick, would dick. But I begin to construct mental images. She fills the room with this intertwining assortment of dead, wood, and dick. I lose the narrative thread of her report. I can't hear anything else but the words, dead, wood, and dick, repeating themselves in endless patterns, virtually filling the room with wood dicks, <laughs> taking geometric shapes in front of my eyes. <laughs> well, I have to pretend to write in the roll book, and then I have to cover my mouth with the back of my hand so no one will see me laughing, and I have to reach up periodically and pinch the moisture from my eyes, and I think I'm holding it together pretty well, and my shoulders aren't shaking at all. And all of a sudden, the narrative flow of wood dicks suddenly stops. Miss K, Natalie says, are you crying? <laughs> all 32 heads. <laughs> now, in a moment like this, there's still an infinite number of professional teacher responses that one could make. Unless you're me, and then there's only one response. I put down my pen, walked over to the closet, opened the doors, got inside, closed the closet door, and let the prisoners fly. I howled. It was so funny and it felt so good to finally let that out. And when that wave of laughter subsided, I realized suddenly what it looked like from their point of view. <laughs> At this point in my life, I had been a student for probably 16 years, and I had never seen a single teacher go into a closet before. <laughs> when that wave of laughter subsided, there was a soft knocking on the door. It was Natalie. Miss K, are you all right in there, she says. That's when I realized that what goes into a closet must eventually come out. So I pushed open the doors and stepped out into the most raucous, standing ovation, took my bow. <laughs> you know, I realize that high school kids are honor-bound to test the new teacher. I know that. I just didn't know I was even being tested until I already passed. So confident, I could see it in his eyes. Hamza Khalil. Well, um, I was one of the few people who wanted to come to the United States from Pakistan, not for jihad, but to actually get like a college <laughs> This is like literally the other end of the earth for us, like. If we take a giant needle and you stick it in LA and through the globe, on the other side it will probably come out somewhere near my house. <laughs> so, of course I was bound to miss a few things when I got here. And the thing that I missed most was having servants. <laughs> because everybody in Pakistan has servants. And you have like a driver, you have a chef, a maid, another driver who's kind of old and blind by now. <laughs> a gardener, and then you have like six or seven people having tea, watching the gardener as he does his work. And it gets to a point where there are more servants than there are like household people, but anyway. So, and what it meant for me here was, uh, my house is always dirty and messy, with like food stuff lying around and random shit because I'm so lazy and unclean. But anyway, that's, pro that's probably why nobody moved in touch with me. 
to my building for the past six months. So I'm sitting there alone one day, and I see this fruit fly coming, and it's hanging there, and I'm like, hey, buddy, uh, I'm happy to see signs of life. Like, would you mind hanging out for a bit? Like, you can be my pet. And the fruit fly was like, okay, uh, your place looks dirty enough. Maybe we can, like, work something out. Like, sure. And what I didn't know while I was extending the invitation was that uh, they fuck more than rabbits on Viagra. And, <laughs> Like within two or three days, it got to a point where I was actually like a hostage in my own house. <laughs> and I thought that maybe this was the meaning of my life, to raise these so that they go out and like conquer the world. But <laughs> anyway, so I was faced with two choices now. Like either I clean my house or wait till the winter to kill all the bugs. And cleaning my house was too much work, so I decided to wait till the winter. <laughs> and I'm hanging out drinking my beer one day and Suddenly I realized that five or six of them are hanging out on top of the can, like having a party. And I was like, okay, this is personal now. Nobody touches my alcohol, like that's it. So I went out the back door to get insecticide, just because the front door had disappeared within a wall of like fruit flies, so I had to go out the back. And I got this truck load of insecticide, and I come back inside my house, and I'm really pissed by now because I had to go to the market just because of these little things. And I start spraying, and I say, and I really get into it, and I still start saying like movie lines like, "Come out, come out, wherever you are, and I'm like, die, bitch, die." As soon as, anyway, uh, they are really clever. They start like hiding into like creeks and corners, and I saw it go and spray everywhere. And suddenly they realize that there was one place that uh, I wasn't spraying, so they all hid inside it. And this happened to be my boxers, and. <laughs> So most of them took refuge in the Holy Land, and I thought maybe I should spray some down there, but then I thought like maybe that wasn't such a good idea. So I went into my room, I changed into my jeans, I pulled my socks on top of my jeans just to like make them airtight, and now I'm really pissed. So I, I have like insecticides in both my hands, and I'm like spinning like a windmill, and I'm like everywhere, I'm spraying it all around. After a while, I realized that my eyes have started to sting, and I can taste the insecticide on my tongue, and my mouth is kind of numb, and I'm dizzy. So I was like, maybe this is enough. Like, maybe I should just go to sleep, and I was like, tomorrow I'll just collect the dead bodies of my enemy. So I went to sleep, and when I woke up, like, I still see like tens of them hanging on my wall. And they were like, hey buddy, have a nice sleep. And I was like, okay, I have to give you this. You are tough little buggers, and I have to respect you. I was just happy they didn't join Al Qaeda because then it would be really hard for both of us, Pakistan and the United States. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Right. You have a good time? Thank you for being here tonight. If, if you weren't here, I would be home alone, editing Wikipedia entries, uh, is that, that is what I do in my free time. There are so many grammatical error, errors in Wikipedia, have you noticed? Yeah. Yes, you have to go in there and then you have to take control, you have to take charge. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Aaron LaRosa. Hi guys, how are you doing? Uh, recently, I was out at this very special place in Los Angeles called Happy Endings. I know it sounds like the kind of place where you go to get a massage, but it's actually a bar. While I was there, I saw these two guys, and one of them looked at me and then turned to his friend, and I heard him say, There goes a fire crotch by, ever seen one? <laughs> Aw, right? <laughs> Now, I understand that there is a certain mystery and at times animosity towards redheads, or my people as I've taken to calling them, but I have to say that this guy did, I read, did, uh, <laughs> this guy did correctly identify what he was looking at, and as a redhead, commentary of this kind is not a rarity. Growing up in Florida under the pressure of constant humidity, my hair took on a kind of primal-like aura on my head. Pieces zigzagged out like frizzy lightning bolts, the final effect looking as my mother used to whine like a bird's nest. 
And if that wasn't punishment enough for a prepubescent girl, I also had shiny metal braces and an extra 20 or so pounds that tipped me into the realm of childhood obesity. <laughs> so, thank you. So, there I was, an oompa loompa of a child with enough issues to give classroom bullies pause on what feature of mine to attack first. But inevitably, it always came back to my hair, which earned me such nicknames as French Fry with Ketchup on Top, Little Orphan Annie, and Carrot Top, which, as I pointed out to them, made no sense, as a carrot top is green and not red. Right? <laughs> I remember the day that I found out that I would, in fact, grow red pubic hair. <laughs> My older cousin Lauren was visiting from New York, and I looked up to her with the kind of admiration that gay men reserve for Liza Minnelli. <laughs> she was the sister I never had, so I took anything she said as law. And at this point, Lauren was 14, so she had already been through the ravages of puberty. So she was acutely aware of how she looked at all times. So even though the pool we swam in was just in my backyard, she still felt this compulsion to shave every day and apply lipstick and make sure her hair didn't get wet. Why do you need to shave? I asked her one day. Because I'm older than you. I just grow more hair. I've thought about that. About growing more hair? Well, my hair is blonde, I said. And it was true, the hair on my arms and legs was practically invisible. I guess I'll never have to shave. And I smiled back at her. And I remember Lauren turning to me with the kind of maniacal grimace I'd seen on my brother right before he'd give me an Indian rug burn. When you get older, she said, you're going to grow red hair everywhere. <laughs> then she pointed to the bottom part of her bikini. Even here. <laughs> I will not, I screamed. At the time, the idea of red hair covering my body like some sort of monkey fur was enough to make me feel like I might as well kill myself now. <laughs> Lauren was right about the bikini part, but that's pretty much the only other place it sprouted. As I left middle school and went into high school, people started, well, stopped focusing on the hair on my head and instead focused on the hair down there. I guess it's probably why I didn't date much, because after all, it's hard to look a boy from class in the eye once you've walked through the school cafeteria to a veritable chorus crying out, fire crotch, in your direction. <laughs> Which, believe me, did happen. I've never heard the pubic hair of a blonde or a brunette or any other color besides a redhead discussed so openly. Which I guess is why at that dingy bar I felt the need I felt compelled, really, to say something to this guy, to point out that I am more than just a fire crotch, that I am a person with feelings and ears that can hear things. So I decided to pull one of those moves that you see in chick flicks, where the woman who's being cheated on see her sees her husband's lover out at a bar, right? So she turns, growls, and then marches right up to that bitch and punches her in the nose, except when I did it, I tripped on my heel and fell flat on my face in front of him. I was really embarrassed. But I got up, and he helped me up, and I looked him in the eye, and I said, thank you, but in a way that really means, fuck you, you know? I didn't get to say everything I wanted to to this guy, but I think I got the message across that if you say anything about a redhead, we will either fall on or around you. <laughs> and that's happy ending enough for me. Thank you, Aaron. And since he's much taller than me, we'll do this. All right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, round of applause for Alfred Brown. Hello, welcome. Uh, so, I was about 11 years old when I had my first chance with a girl. I went to the Westminster Mall, which was close to where I lived. And uh, I thought it was close, but my mother thought it was much too far. And there were too many killers and thieves and kidnappers around every corner in what has been called the safest city in the country, Huntington Beach. And since it's close to the ocean, there's probably some pirates, too. So, she insisted on driving me to the mall. 
when I got there, it was close to Mother's Day, so I went and I got my mom some candy from C's Candy. I come out and I'm holding this bag of gumdrops and jelly beans, I believe it was, when uh, I get approached by two girls, one of whom is kind of pretty. And though I didn't realize it at the time, what was going to happen was going to prepare me for the rest of my life. <laughs> so, uh, the kind of pretty one approaches me and says, you know, what's your name? I'm, of course, flabbergasted and flummoxed and have no idea what to say. So I say, Aloysius. I don't know where I got that, probably, <laughs> probably from some Looney Tunes cartoon or something. Uh, nor did I know why I wanted to hide my identity. It's not like at 11 I was scared with the identity theft. Or, for that matter, she was going to track me down to my school and then make fun of me. So, I don't know why I was scared. But there was anxiety, as there always is. And uh, I knew my mom was going to come pick me up. So, and I didn't want my mom to see me cavorting with these loose women. So, and I didn't, I didn't want uh, them to see me getting into the car with my mom either, because I'm 11, I should have my own car. <laughs> Who knows what's going through an 11-year-old's mind. So, anyways, uh, me me, after that, um, I decided to, you know, introduce myself again. So anyway, she says to me, what's your name? Uh, Aloysius. Um, where are you from? Uh, around? <laughs> uh, okay, uh, what kind of school do you go to? Uh, I, I, I don't go to school. And then she asks me, okay, so are you going to eat all that candy yourself? I'm like, oh, this, um, no, this isn't for me. This is for my, uh, in fact, I think I've seen my car. Actually, it's not my car, it's my mom. I, I, I gotta go. And I ran. I wish I could make it sound more dignified, but there's only so much dignity when you're 11. I bolted. And, well, as soon as I got to my car, I immediately was filled with regret. I was thinking to myself, you know, how could I let this happen? You know, uh, and I started to, well, basically, self-flagellate myself mentally with lots of insults, um, calling myself stupid and scared, and things like stupid scaredy head. And, <laughs> I mean, what do you expect some clever portman too when you're like, you know, 11? So, uh, but after that, um, well, I decided I was going to make things right. So I'm going to get on my bicycle and I'm going to bike back there, and if there's any, any justice in the world, she will be there when I get back. And of course, there's no justice in the world, so she wasn't there, and I missed yet another opportunity. I don't think uh, there's ever been another girl so bored in my many years since then. Um, that was, of course, being paid to be so. Um, and there were a couple of those, yes. Um, uh, but uh, actually there was one girl, and when she know it, she would eventually become my girlfriend for two and a half years. And even though the last year was nothing but arguing, they were still the best two and a half years of my life. However, if I had my mother waiting for me when I was introduced to this girl, I doubt I would have accepted her advances, and my best two and a half years would have been the ones that sucked the least. Thank you. Because <laughs> really, if, you, if, if this weren't happening tonight, I would, I would, I would be, uh, I would go out to go see Step Up Greedy again. <laughs> I went opening weekend, didn't you? Come on, it's Step Up and it's in 3D. It's amazing. Nobody would go with me. Seriously, none of my friends wanted to see Step Up Greedy. I could not even convince my own mother to come with me. And she is so desperate for contact with me that she spams me like multiple times per day. And even she did not want to come to Step Up Rudy with me. So I went alone to a late showing. I was the only one in the theater. It was, it was almost as sad as Alfred's story. But uh, uh, it was, but you know, next time, next time you'll come with me. Because I know, I know you wanted to go and you were embarrassed. 
But if you were with me, you wouldn't be. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please give a big hand to welcome to the stage, Josh Jacobson. I hate my clothes. It doesn't matter what I wear, I either look like a neo-Nazi, or if I'm wearing a suit, a corporate executive neo-Nazi, or a douchebag. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with the term douchebag, it's not meant to be taken literally, but rather just a generic derogatory term for any male who wears v-neck t-shirts low cut enough to show off their freshly waxed man cleavage, who uses so much, his skin is so orange from using bronzing cream that they look like they could cure scurvy with a single glance, <laughs> and whose hair is spiked into dangerously sharp spikes, as if to defend their brains against multisyllabic words. <laughs> now, while I clearly don't have enough hair to spike, and my skin's not very orange, it's pretty pale, I do like the t-shirts, I gotta tell you. <laughs> so, my stepdad Lucas is partially to blame for me looking like a douchebag. He buys my clothes because apparently that's what stepfathers are for. He works at Macy's department stores, in the maintenance department, and feels that if he's qualified to fix an air conditioner, he's qualified to design somebody's wardrobe, <laughs> particularly mine. I think the other part of it is he's a man, he makes less than my mom, and he still wants to feel like he's the provider, so he provides the family with clothes, and I wear them because I'm not going to turn down anything free. I haven't bought a piece of clothing in the four years they've been married, so I'm really hoping the marriage works out. <laughs> One day Lucas comes home from work and he's very excited about the newest piece of clothing he's bought me. You're going to love it, Josh. And I know I'm going to love it because it was free. Again, I didn't know. So he takes it out of the Macy's bag and it's this gray hooded sweatshirt. And, you know, for a minute I am pretty excited. And then he unfolds it and I see the back with an image of a dagger piercing through a skull. <laughs> Flanked by red hummingbirds <laughs> and tigers that are blue and green for some reason. It looks like the kind of tattoo a sailor would get if that sailor were on acid and had been lobotomized. <laughs> but, that, but that's not even the worst part. The worst part is the name spanning across the back. Ed Hardy. <laughs> now, if you're not familiar with the work of Edward Hardy, let me tell you, he is a world-renowned designer of clothing for douchebags. <laughs> and while I'm trying to eschew that image of myself, it seems that Lucas, my stepfather, still wants me to dress like one. I sort of am tonight. <laughs> so, I mean, I feel like the whole thing could probably be fixed really easily if I just started buying my own clothes. But I'm not going to do that. Clothes are expensive. So, over the next few days, Lucas's excitement about the jacket does not wane. He wants to know, have I worn it yet? What do your friends think about it? Let me tell you, I don't need to wear it to know what my friends are thinking. About. They're going to look at me and think I'm a douchebag. One Saturday, the family is preparing for the outing to Costco because that's what you do on Saturdays in Missouri. It's part, it's part of our religion. Costco on Saturdays, church on Sundays. My mom keeps the Costco coupon book right next to the family Bible in the kitchen for easy reference. And normally, I'm on board for a ritualistic Costco outing, but this Saturday it's rainy and kind of chilly, and I know if I go out on a in a t-shirt, Lucas is going to take one look at me and go, well, where's your new jacket? <laughs> so I don't want to hurt his feelings, and I put on this damn thing, and I get to the car, and I see my mother, and my younger sister, and Lucas, all in gray sweatshirts, all with red hummingbirds <laughs> and, <laughs> and tigers and amazing technicolor dream coats. <laughs> Lucas liked the jacket so much, he bought everyone in the household an Ed Hardy jacket. Which would be fine if we were on our way to a spray tan convention. <laughs> but we're not. And I know to the pious patrons of the Independence Missouri Costco, we're going to look like we're auditioning for Jersey Shore. <laughs> but I see Lucas, and he's proud, and he's the patriarch. And I know to him, we look like his family, even if we are just a family of douchebags. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Josh.
gosh. Welcome to the stage. Uh, big round of applause for Greta Enzer. So when I lost the desire to hustle acting gigs and decided to die and become a teacher, my friend said to me, I said to my friend, I just want to have a normal life and have babies. And she said to me, that was a very attainable goal that not everybody makes it in Hollywood, but lots of people get married and have kids. And she was so encouraging, she made it sound like a toothpaste commercial. And I bought it. And then I did the L.A. dating scene. <laughs> and a uh, Playgirl centerfold, a body double for Stallone, a man with Hodgkin's lymphoma and no health insurance. These were not father material. They drove me to celibacy. But what's a girl to do when she still needs a daddy for her babies? Inner Sean King, wellness coach. I knew Sean King from first grade because we went to Hanley Elementary School together in Saginaw, Michigan. And in sixth grade, he and Allison came to my house for lunch to rendezvous for their first kiss. And then in eighth grade, my friend Samantha lost her flower to him, and she told me how he asked her for a hat. I didn't know there were those kind of hats. So he finds me on Facebook, and he sends me to his website, and I'm kind of rolling my eyes because I know he's a player. And there he's peddling raw honey. And I see this other video of him on YouTube in his black ninja suit and he's twirling nunchucks. And I'm finding him strangely attractive. <laughs> and I had to show my girlfriends because nunchucks are just too good not to share. And he wins my girlfriends over in the video. And the vote is out that among my prospects, Sean King is the one. But I'm still not convinced until he has me over for lunch. He comes to the door in this white beater tee, which is very Saginaw, Michigan, ghetto, our hometown where Habitat for Humanity is not building homes, but rather tearing them down. <laughs> and, you know, I brought the wine, and he's made me this amazing vegetarian meal, and we're catching up because we've never really had a conversation in 30 years of knowing each other. And I didn't think we had anything in common until I saw Cash Flow on his bookshelf. Now, Cash Flow is the Robert Kiyosaki game of how to become a millionaire. And I, I had it for years, but never learned how to play it. So Sean teaches me how to play it. And I draw the teacher card, which is ironic because I'm a teacher. And I buy the condo and the board game. And then six months later, I move out of my studio apartment and I buy a condo. Is it coincidence or the influence of the king? So we're at this Thai vegetarian cafe and we're talking and you know, I'm saying I'm trying to, you know, get my master's and make 20000 more a year. And he's saying, like, $20,000 a year, I'm going to make $20,000 a month. And he's telling me about this girl that he's dating who has three kids and how it's a dead end and they're never going to get married or have kids. And I said, I'll have your baby. And I said, I mean, I have to finish my master's, so you have some time to think about it. Two years. And he says, well, there'd be stipulations. And I say... Like what, I'd have to be vegetarian? And he says, well, for starters. And he says, and if it were planned, you'd have to take supplements. I say, supplements? And he said, and do a cleanse. And I'm like, can't we just throw some sperm up there and see if it sticks? <laughs> so I didn't expect these negotiations, but he did pick up the tab for lunch, which was kind of a nice touch to the business deal. And um, we even shared food, like an old married couple. And when I was 15, I kissed Kirk Rittering, and I said, these lips have kissed a vegetarian. I shall never eat meat again. And I did it for eight years. And then I was in New York City, and there was like the sheet of filet mignon being thrown in the trash as I was catering for the creme de la creme. And I was like, who am I saving? And I ate the steak. So. After all these years, can I give up meat for his baby? The wellness coach drives a hard bargain. So all my friends are like, go for it. Just 
sneak your steak on the side. And I'm like, what happened to honesty and trust in a relationship? I mean, other people sleep with men in dirty hotel rooms, and there I'd be in a dining hall, sneaking snake, steak, hoping nobody would see me. So I'm at Sean's house, and we're watching this Alex Gray DVD. And Alex Gray is this artist who met his wife, who is also an artist, while tripping on LSD. And um, he's talking about how he realized his full potential of God as an artist. And there's all these portraits of people kissing and copulating and birthing babies. And I'm thinking, what is Sean having me watch? And then I'm lying on the couch and I'm smelling him and he's never smelled so good. And the pheromones are going out of control and I realize I've fallen into the Sean King trap. I am swooning. I'm having these fantasies of us doing jitsu with him teaching me self-defense and me pinning him to the ground. And then Chardonnay's like, your love is king, is playing in the background. So <clears throat> my parents paid for my sister to go to my uncle's funeral when he dies in Michigan, but not me. And I'm really upset. And so I call Sean, and he tells me how he understands my anger, but that it's all part of my journey and that it's really about forgiveness. And in that moment, instead of wanting to take nunchucks to my father, I'm thinking maybe Sean would be a good father to my children. And maybe just like Alex Gray, found the full potential of God as an artist, then maybe so can I. Thank you, Greta. All right. Having fun still? Having fun? Yes. Yes, because if it wasn't editing Wikipedia for years or going to see Step Up Reading again, I would be home watching one of my uh, Dateline murder specials. I have like I have like a dozen of them on my DVR. Those Keith Morrison asked penetrating questions. He, he's really tough on those people. Um, welcome to the stage, ladies and gentlemen, Andy Apui. I am standing in Target watching a security guard look through my purse and he's looking for something that's triggered the alarm system. Now usually they would let me pass but I was, as the guard said, looking very suspicious because <laughs> over the past 30 minutes I had been walking in and out of the star and I did this three times. The reason why I was doing this was because I forgot my list of things that I needed to buy, so I would forget the things that I would need to get until I was out of the store. And like I said, I did this three times. But they were really important things. I mean, the first time it was paper towels, the second time it was toilet paper, the third time it was the collector's edition of Sex and the City. You know, the one with the faux covering and stuff like that. Don't judge me. So anyways, while he's rifling through my purse, I start thinking about at this time when I was a teenager, where I had a similar experience. I was actually going to Bahrain with my mother, and we were going to visit my father, who was on project there. And my bag actually was flagged with airport security, so a guard had to go in and rifle through it. They had seen something suspicious in the x-ray monitors. And so while he was rifling through, I was 13, so I mean, I started, I was really scared. I thought I could actually go to jail. And I was wondering what is in my bag that could probably send me there. So I started thinking about my love letters to you know, Dookie Hauser, MD, before I knew he was gay. Um, I was thinking of my George Michael pictures that I had in my book, but before I knew he was gay too. And um, my REM CDs. And, I swear to God, I had no idea that the lead singer was gay until last year. <laughs> but anyways, while I was thinking, the guard pulls out a tampon. Now, I'm, again, I'm 13 years old, so, and I'm on my period, so of course, everything is just exaggerated. I see everybody in the airport staring at me, and just laughing and saying, you know, oh, you know, you suck, you have your period. 
mortified. So anyways, the guard is looking at this tampon, he can't figure out what it is, so he calls over another guard. That guard can't figure out what it is either, so he calls over another guard. So, and this is Bahrain, so there aren't any female airport security guards to school these guys on what they're pulling at, you know, tapping, and yes, at one point even licking. And, but the worst part about it was that my mother was also on her period that month. And after about 10 minutes of head scratching and just being completely confused, she had had enough and she yells, You fucking idiot! What do you think this is? A bloody firecracker! And she pulls out her maxi pad to prove her point. She starts flapping the wing. She's like, just like this! Except you stick it up, alright? I was dying. <laughs> and then a look of recognition crosses over the guard's face. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Diaper! I don't know what's worse. Having the Bahrain government think that I'm a terrorist with a bright pink Easy Glide firecracker or that I'm incontinent. <laughs> Anyways, back to Target. The guard finally finds what he's looking for. He takes the object out of the bag, he runs it past the sensors, and it goes beep. He has it. He hands it to me, and it's a tampon with a security sensor stuck onto it. And he starts laughing, and he says to me, Really not that time of the month for you, is it? I don't know, at least you didn't think it was a diaper, right? All right, all right. We're getting closer and closer to the raffle time. I'll, I'll let you know when you get to pass your raffle tickets up. Because we're, we're giving away free stuff tonight. Yeah, free stuff. It's very exciting. Um, everybody loves free stuff. Uh, but right now, before we do that, we're going to welcome to the stage Krishna Narayana Murthy. So my mother-in-law is visiting from India, and you know what that means. It means there's an endless supply of good, fresh Indian food in the house. But it also means there's an extra set of hands helping out with the baby so my wife and I can rediscover what sleep feels like. See, I love my mother-in-law. She's a saint. It's the rest of my wife's family that belongs in hell. But anyway, since my wife's mom is doing so much for us at home, we figured, boy, we've got to find a way to keep her entertained so that she never leaves. So we subscribe to this package of Indian television channels that stream online, and that's all we've been watching lately. Now, I was born and raised here, so I don't really get Indian movies. I don't mean the, the mainstream stuff out of Bollywood, because what's not to get? <laughs> Bollywood is kind of like Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly kept making movies, but were forced to relocate to India, change their names, and put on brown face. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the movies... The movies of the South Indian region, where, where most of my family is originally from, those can be a little bit darker. And by that, I mean creepy and excessively violent, although they're still musicals. <laughs> so, we're, we're watching this movie on the Kannada language channel, and uh, after a typical song and dance routine, suddenly, a woman is hit in the face with an axe. <laughs> Now, I don't have much of a tolerance for violence against women in, in any language, but this axe in the face thing was just kind of weirdly mesmerizing for some reason. See, the story is about this guy with mob connections, and he's, he's trying to clean up his life, so he gets in on his job, meets a beautiful woman, and decides to marry her. But just as they're sitting down under the mandap to have the, the Hindu wedding ceremony, the mob goons show up at the door, and this one particularly nasty looking dude pulls this object out from his, behind his back and sort of shot puts it down the aisle. And you watch it sort of uh, spin in slow motion as it flies across the room. And at first you think, oh, it, it's just a small stick. What's he going to do with that? But then as it comes more into focus, oh wait, it, it's a knife. No, 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 it's, it's a hatchet. No, wait, it's a tomahawk. Holy crap, it's 
a full-fledged fireman's axe. And the gangster had been aiming for the groom, but instead he hits the bride right in the forehead where her red dot of kumkum powder should be. And, and the axe splits her skull open and just kind of plants itself there for like an uncomfortable amount of time. And, and it leaves you thinking, oh my God, how could someone do this to a bride on her wedding day? But, but she survives. <laughs> and, and her husband spends the rest of the movie trying to get revenge, albeit unsuccessfully. And the woman now with like half a face and severe brain damage uh, has to fit in with her husband's family, although they're hiding her up in the attic so that no one sees her. And uh, she's got to fight to keep her inheritance or something crazy. So at this point, I I've had enough. And uh, I turn to my wife, Ash, who is sitting next to me, and unlike me, actually lived in India for several years. And I ask her, so honey, does this sort, does this sort of thing happen often in Bangalore? And Ash has been paying no attention to the movie whatsoever, which is apparently how Indian cinema is meant to be viewed. <laughs> and instead she starts talking about how if things get any worse with the economy here, we should move to India. And I'm thinking, you know, I don't know if I'm really cut out for India. I can't really support a country that would produce this film. <laughs> then again, we've made Charlie's Angels full throttle. <laughs> but anyway, I, I start to worry. What if, what if Ash is right? I mean, I had believed CNBC when they said that America always bounces back, but what if it doesn't this time? What if this is the end of the empire? What if my parents, who, who immigrated here in the 60s, what if they made a huge mistake and invested in the wrong country? It's like they bought America's stock when it was at its highest, and now it's worthless. That's not the Warren Buffett way. <laughs> Meanwhile, India is not just taking away American jobs and capital, it's taking over the culture. Here in Los Angeles, there is a yoga studio literally on every street corner. And I'm the only Indian person that goes to any of them. <laughs> Maybe all the, these, these beautiful, flexible white people who are seeking enlighten enlightenment, <laughs> maybe they're onto something. Maybe the USA is really the RMS Titanic. And it's time for all of us to grab the next life raft to India. Hmm? Well, the patriot in me will probably stay right here and go down with the ship if it comes to that. But uh, hey, the rest of you who might still be on the fence, I'm telling you, a future Indian empire could happen. And you could get in on the ground floor. You know, everybody's got their attention on, a, on another Asian contender. But unlike China, India is a thriving democracy. You can find the same rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that you can find here. Unless, of course, you've just been hit in the face with an axe. <laughs> Thank you. So, rounding out the portion of the evening, so please give a big applause for our last student storyteller, Jennifer Mitchell. So the other day, I found a lump in my right breast. It was morning, so I tried to go about the day casually, trying to pretend that nothing wrong happened. But of course, in Los Angeles, you have so much time to sit in the car and think. So I'm driving around in traffic, and I'm thinking about breast cancer the whole time. Like, what if I have it? I don't want breast cancer, is my first thought. But I have a history of it in my family, and I've always had skin issues, like moles doctors have told me to watch out for, that kind of thing. So I'm a little scared. And I'm also thinking, about all those women who have to get one or both breasts removed to cure their cancer. I don't have that much to start with. <laughs> Why would God take away what little boob I have? <laughs> now, I have always thought that plastic surgery is such a horrible trend. But that day in my car, just after finding a lump in my breast, I'm pretty much planning on having it. I mean, if just one had to go, I'd at least want them to even me out. 
And then, you know, as long as I'm there, I might as well go up a cup size or two. <laughs> I even start thinking that this might be my chance to be a busty woman. <laughs> I imagine myself walking around with C cups. And then I realize that I am so living in Los Angeles. And I just had the plastic surgery fantasy to prove it. <laughs> I went to my boyfriend's house later that night. And I looked at him and I said, will you touch my boob? And he was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> and I was like, no, this is serious. <laughs> I think I found a lump today. So he was like, okay, and he touched my boob. And then he asked, can I touch the other one? And I was like, no, you jerk, this is not a joke. I have a history of this in my family and I've been worried all day. And he was like, no, I just wanted to see if the other one felt like the first one. And I'm like, okay, that's a good idea. So he felt my other boob and he's like, you know, there's like kind of a little of this in this one too. So I kind of felt around and I'm like, okay, I think you're right. But I felt the first one and I still felt like it felt a little funny. I tried to lighten the mood and I'm like, you know, I might have to get plastic surgery, laughing. And he was like, really? Kind of excited. <laughs> and I'm like, no, not just for fun. Completely forgetting the fact that I had dreamed of C-cups earlier that day. Then I got a little more serious and I'm like, you know, what if I have to lose my boobs? They do that, you know, to cure this. And then he got serious because he could tell that I was a little scared. And he's like, this is nothing. You're going to be fine. Nothing is going to happen. So I went to the doctor later that week and sure enough, nothing was wrong. I am so happy that I don't have breast cancer. But I am still considering plastic surgery. <laughs> Maybe C-cups. No. Probably D cups. <laughs> no, definitely double D. Thank you. All right, we'll wrap it up to our special guest tonight. Did you have fun with that first portion of the evening? The opening play of East West Players' 45th anniversary season is a play called Mysterious Skin, written by me, based on the uh, world-famous novel by Scott Heim. Uh, it premieres in September, and one lucky person today will go home with a pair of tickets to that show. It's a $74 value, free to one of you. Uh, MPW faculty and staff are not eligible, and the performers tonight are not eligible. So, uh, are, have you all filled out your raffle forms? Yes. Okay, so fill them out now, as we take a little uh, 10 second break. And pass your raffle forms to your left. Pass them to your left. And then the person on the aisle will be responsible for those raffle forms that I will come to collect. All right. Are you excited for our special guests? I am very excited for our special guests. Richard Mullins is coming back to the stage to introduce our special guest this evening. who's um, doing a documentary about um, Shelley Berman. So she's here tonight taking photos. Uh, so, so first up uh, is someone who should be, uh, we have, first Sandra will come up and um, Sandra Sing Lo should actually be the poster child for MPW, I think. She's um, someone who cooks on all burners. She's an a essay writer. She's an amazing um, storyteller and performer. She has her uh, show, The Lowdown on Science, on NPR. Um, her novel is, uh, she has a wonderful novel called um, If You Lived Here, You'd Be Home By Now. 
Her latest book is Mother on Fire. Even her titles are funny. Um, she's also a contributor to the Atlantic Monthly, where she's also a contributing editor. She's a frequent contributor to publications all over the planet. Uh, she's also an activist and one of the best chroniclers and witnesses of Los Angeles that we're uh, lucky to have. In other words, um, she's sort of a visionary. Uh, she's incredibly funny and provocative, but she's also empathetic. It seems to me that she is, as Garcia Lorca says, always on the side of those who have nothing. There's an ongoing context of social and political awareness in her work, and she sees that gender and class often preempt other considerations in one's life. She's always a champion for the underdog. She's interested in change. She's been reporting, shaping, and creating spaces for social thought and awareness in her work, through her work, for two decades. She's persistent. She's someone that can be described as a visionary in the true sense of the word. Please join me in welcoming Sandra Singh Lowe. Well, thank you so much, and in celebration of that wonderful introduction, I'm going to do a monologue that was written before I became a visionary. <laughs> there is no social activism in this piece. There is nothing to be gained at all from listening to this story. Uh, you guys were so fun. I was really delighted. I, I, I laughed. I laughed in, in all of your pieces. And, and cheers, Kate. Like, good cheers. Good cheers. Uh, and I was particularly moved by all of your dating stories. Word of advice, though, if you get desperate in your dating travails and decide to date your friend, don't do it. <laughs> and this story, I, I hope, will prove that. Um, it's a piece from a one woman show I did um, off Broadway in '98 um, called Bad Sex with Bud Camp. <laughs> <laughs> Just 30 seconds of intro, when I think back, because this was written a long time ago, I think that when you hear about um, stories about dating, the hot sex is always covered. What about the bad sex? Hey, you know, that's really lousy and goes on and on. Well, here we go. <laughs> bad sex with Bud Kemp. Bud Kemp was a guy I'd known for eight years, first in college, then at the pharmaceutical corporation where I work. I'd always thought of Bud as a nice guy, and not unattractive. Not exactly attractive, either. <laughs> he had good features, tall, wavy brown hair, lanky build, but there always seemed to be this kind of beaten quality to Bud, in his sad smile, stooped shoulders, pear shape, as though he were being flogged by life. <laughs> Sexually, Bud Kemp was an inert object. <laughs> that perception changed dramatically one night, early in the summer of my 31st year. Although not really intimate, Bud and I were in the habit of going to the movies every Thursday night. This movie night tradition had been started by our little dorm group in college, although, of course, as members drifted towards 30, pairing up or marrying people from the outside, it left Bud, I, and movie night behind. No doubt Bud had also tried to leave Bud, I, and movie night behind. I tried myself, but it was difficult. I've never been one of those women who walks into a room in a lycra mini dress, hair moose to staggering proportions, and the men just drop dead all around. No, my charms are more subtle. <laughs> I'm the kind of girl guys fall back on. Tireless listener, lender of money. <laughs> Provider of Xanax. Ride to LAX. <laughs> and so, as though held together by gravity, eight years later, Bud and I would still find ourselves sitting together in the darkened movie theater, clutching separate containers of popcorn, not saying a word. Hardly a date, I think. Page turn. <laughs> but one night, I looked over at Bud during the opening credits. And for the first time, I realized what a sharp profile he had. <laughs> what relatively clear skin. <laughs> and his cla 
hands clasped over one big knee. They were nice too. Suddenly a, a phrase popped into my mind. The strong, capable hands of Bud Kemp. <laughs> strong, capable, silent. What deep waters lay beneath this silence? Suddenly I was madly curious to find out. Could this Bud Kemp be used for sex? <laughs> so things are getting hot, if in kind of a lukewarm way. The coming of our Pharmaceutical Corporation Summer Softball League in Torrance makes them even hotter. Think about it, Torrance. <laughs> oh yeah, once a year, Summer Softball provides we who labor in Sector D7 with a reason to just go wild. We may leave work five minutes early one Friday, wear funny raccoon hats with our team names on them, yell woo woo for no reason at all. <laughs> My team, the Fly Balls, is composed mostly of the four Fs of the softball universe. Skinny guys in Greenpeace t-shirts, reluctant wives and girlfriends, little Ramon from the mailroom. No wonder we were being beaten, whipped, dominated. <laughs> by Terminator 2000, the league leaders. Bitching for them today? Bud Kemp. <laughs> That's right, it's a little known fact about Bud. He did play a year of junior varsity basketball in college. So what if it was at a small science school with a 57 game losing streak? So what if Bud was thrown onto the court mainly for use as a human shield? The point is, in Sector D7, Bud Kemp is our sports stud. And a damn good-looking one, too. Hair faintly blonded from the sun, skin lightly tanned. And are those new glasses? <laughs> God, yes, instead of sad clown sideways teardrops, these are cool wire rims. Sting wears wire rims. <laughs> Bud steps onto the mound, pulls his t-shirt off, and his naked torso is... Okay! 33 and holding is the triumphal message here. Although he's no Schwarzenegger, there are definite suggestions of biceps and pecs. More than suggestions, announcements even. Not very loud announcement, but the point is sit-ups are being completed, racquetball played, body parts attended to, secretly anointed, perhaps. Is it just my third fuzzy navel talking? Or is Bud Camp ready for sex? We're at Pizza Hut now, talking and laughing. Sex is definitely in the air tonight for everyone in Sector D7. Beer slosh, music thumbs, lamp sway, people in funny raccoon hats worm up against each other. Bud and I are no exception. Underneath the table, thigh to thigh, sweat pant to sweat pant. We're doing kind of a sensual leg thing. It's kind of laugh and kick out. Laugh and kick out. Obviously, it's driving him wild. You want to go somewhere? Bud says, like, yeah, bud. I say, um, um, yeah. What? It's so loud and wild in here, no one would notice if you tore, tore your own bra off and used it as a lasso. In my case, it would be the sexy black bra I slipped on in the bathroom for a guy called Bud Kemp. Away from here, he repeats. How about your place? Sounds great. All righty then. All righty. We're hitting secret code now. Bud and Kemp and I are talking, moving as one. I sense almost by telepathy that he wants to swing by the 7-Eleven for a six-pack. We skate effortlessly through the glooming, luminescent aisles like Torvald Shh. We pause calmly. That's a very old reference, but very special. <laughs> Bartles and James wine coolers, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, my fellow seniors. All right. <laughs> we pause, pause, pause calmly, almost worshipfully, before the glass refrigerators, which present their dramatic panoramas, endless vistas of possibility. Heineken, Dos Equis, Tsing Chow, Kieran, Moosehead, Fosters. The whole world is ours, literally, through beer. <laughs> he chooses Coors. 
Rivers. <laughs> I say I like it too. I guess we both like it, he says. We both? <laughs> and suddenly, I have a vision of, of Bud Kemp and I together on a Sunday morning, reading the paper, drinking our favorite General Foods International Coffee. <laughs> another rather hoary chestnut, another reference on us. Never mind! Amaretto Hazelnut, the one we both like. And instead of my weekends yawning empty, I will be spending them with someone, together, doing things. Not just updating wi wi Wikipedia like Prince is doing. First it was movies, now it is beer. Soon it will be cars, vacations, houses, children. This is the vision I cling on to as we return to his condo in Redondo Beach, drain the beer, move to leftover gallo, as I sit in the living room and rub and rub and rub Bud Camp's neck. And Bud Camp talks and talks and talks about what else? Bud Camp. <laughs> And sometimes I wonder if I'm really suited for a career in pharmaceutical management. I mean, what if my calling is something more in the marketing of an applied plastics field? <laughs> what kind of plastics did you have in mind? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Single cell liposome polymer, blah, 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 blah. Blah, blah, me, me, me. Blah, blah, blah. Me, me, me. Blah, blah, blah. Me, me, me. He is making me lose hold of my vision. We need to escalate things to the next level. Bud, I say, let's go to bed. The moon slants in through the shade, transforming everything into misshapen lumps. It is uncomfortably warm and stuffy. Bud is lying on his bed, fully clothed, frozen. This is so weird, he says, after all this time. I know, I say, but I think you're going to like it. <laughs> I sit on the edge of the bed, remove one shoe, then the other. But Kemp does not move, make any invitation. I shove in next to him. Suddenly, horny in a kind of confused, primeval way. We grapple each other like circus bears. <laughs> His head is buried in my shoulder. He is stroking my hair with these odd petting motions. <laughs> this kind of humming sound. <laughs> I find myself energetically Massaging his shoulders. I don't know why. Move down, lower back, move down, buttocks. But it seems invasive to be massaging the buttocks of such an old friend, so I find myself merely patting them as though in congratulation. Oh, if only we could get that sensual leg thing going again. Laugh and kick out. Laugh and kick out. But there is no laughter here. Only worry and sweat. How I long for Pizza Hut with its pepperoni-laced orgy-like ambiance. <laughs> Sex between two people can be such a lonely thing. Grimly pushing on, I pull my t-shirt off, revealing my sexy black bra. His cue to just go wild. But Ben Kemp is rubbing his eyes with both hands. Still I wait with accusing breasts. Still Bud rubs, making this kind of faint humming sound. And I realize that Bud Kemp cannot bring himself to face my breasts in all their terrible candor. They blaze in the darkness like headlights, illuminating the falseness of all those movie nights. Eventually he stops rubbing and just lies there with both hands cupped over his eyes as though expecting to be flogged. His nostrils quiver. Is that a snort? <laughs> My 
idea is that we will never speak of this incident again, see each other, or even continue to live in the same state. And we don't, practically, as I learned the next morning in the long, arduous drive back to Pasadena. Burger King coffee blinking like a lizard. But no. Final page turn. The bouquet that arrives the next morning is the ugliest I have ever seen. It is a chaos of white baby's breath, purple lupin, pink carnations, yellow daisies, all stabbing against each other in frantic counterpoint. Even worse is the card, which reads, I saw these flowers and thought of you. <laughs> Love, bud. Love, bud. One thing is for sure, he is not my love bud, and this is not me at age 31. A frantic bouquet, slowly wilting. Pregnant pause, look to the corner, slow dim of lights. Thank you. <laughs> Shelley Berman was one of these revolutionary presences in comedy, and his act and his writing and his presence were part of the shift of consciousness of what funny could be considered. Um, his act was described as a scary soul of reality. His monologues were described as Kafkaesque. Uh, you can read in the program about his many awards. I'm sure I don't need to repeat them. His, his, his landmark... Um, album Inside Shelley Berman was the first non-musical recording to win a Grammy. It was a recording of Shelley actually performing one of his nightclub acts. This was a revolutionary idea at the time. Um, he went on to win three gold records to appear on many, many television shows, debuting on the Jack Parr show, appearing on the Ed Sullivan show, Rosemary Clooney, and countless <coughs> others. His recurring role as Larry David's father on Curb Your Enthusiasm earned him an Emmy nomination. Shelley taught here at MPW for several years, and Sandra Singlo was one of his students. And he is our one and only lecturer emeritus. Shelley is also a poet, and he runs a poetry workshop at the Academy of Motion Pictures Retirement Home. As a solo performer, as a writer, as an American original, Shelley is legendary in so many ways. He's been described as, quote, the cerebral comedian of the USA. He's also been described by Mort Saul as flawless in his timing, aware of the details of life and of the transformative possibilities in being a good witness. It's an honor and it's a pleasure to welcome Shelley Berman. Performing to me. 
meeting, and I, I brought things I'm going to be reading to you. So, but uh, I know that I should hit you with something strong, but I don't have anything like that. <laughs> I, 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 do I seem like I'm out of speech? Uh, that I'm not willing? I didn't sleep well last night. <laughs> it happens now and then. I, I, I watch commercials and, and uh, uh, I get really uh, bothered by them. They seem to penetrate the soul. <laughs> so right now, and even now I'm thinking of the last one I heard. Last for more than four hours. <laughs> Seek medical attention. <laughs> well, I will. <laughs> I'll die before I give it up. step back to, to see them. Uh, so I'm going to, I have two readings for you, and that, that I'm not being funny with that, and neither is the material. <laughs> but this is uh, from, a, if you've ever, it, it will sound familiar to some of you, it will. I'm going to move this over a little bit. Service? Yeah, room service. 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 Yeah, room service.
I feel sorry about this, but I, I just don't know what help you means. What are you saying? <laughs> Money, room service, you want something. Can I have that again, please? Room service, you want something. Yes, this Jew would like something. <laughs> What you want, please? I'd like some eggs. Ace. Eggs. Ace. Is that the same as eggs? Yes, ace. Ace. How would you lie then? I beg your pardon? How would you lie then? I'm not getting that, sir. How would you lie then? How would you lie, you ace? Fry, boy, pooch. How would you lie then? Do I get it? Yeah, I get it. I'll have my ace pooch. <laughs> I beg your pardon, I can't understand you. <laughs> Hotels can supply you with all kinds of misery. Dear May, it's marvelous the way this thing rocks back and forth. <laughs> trying to read it. It went through a lot of service here to, to make sure that I didn't fall on my face. <laughs> Dear May, please do not leave any more of those little bars of soap in my bathroom since I brought my own bath-sized dial. Please remove the six unopened little bars from the shelf under the medicine cabinet and another three in the shower soap dish. They are in my way. Thank you. S. Berman. Dear room 635, <laughs> I am not your regular maid. She will be back tomorrow, Thursday, from her day off. I took the three hotel soaps out of the shower soap dish as you requested. The six bars on your shelf I took out of your way and put on top of your Kleenex dispenser in case you should change your mind. <laughs> this leaves only the three bars I left today, <laughs> which my instructions from the management is to leave three soaps daily. Uh, I hope this is satisfactory. If anything else comes up, please call Mrs. Carmen in the linen room. Dear maid, I hope you are my regular maid. <laughs> Apparently, Kathy did not tell you about my note to her concerning the little bars of soap. When I got back to my room this evening, I found you had added three little camés to the shelf under my medicine cabinet. I'm going to be here in the hotel for a full two weeks and have brought my own bath size dial. <laughs> So I won't need those six little camés which are now on the shelf. They are in my way when shaving, brushing teeth, etc. Please remove them. S. Berman. Dear Mr. Berman, my day off was last Wednesday, so the relief maid left three hotel soaps which we are instructed by the management. I took the six soaps which were in your way on the shelf and put them in the soap case where your dial was. I put the dial in the medicine cabinet for your convenience. I didn't remove the three complimentary soaps which are always placed inside the medicine cabinet for all new check-ins and which you did not object to when you checked in last Monday. Also, I did place three hotel soaps on your shelf as per my instructions from the management since you left no instructions to the contrary. Please let me know if I can be of any further assistance. Or call the linen room. Her name is Miss Carmen. Have a pleasant stay, your regular maid, Dobby. Dear Mr. Berman, the assistant manager, Mr. Ken Setter, informed me this a.m. that you called him last evening and said you were unhappy with your maid service. I have assigned a new girl to your room. I hope you will accept my apologies for any past inconvenience. If you have any future complaints, please contact me so I can give it my personal attention. Call extension 1108 between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Thank you, Elaine Carmen, housekeeper. Dear Miss Carmen, 
It is impossible for me to contact you by phone since I leave the hotel for business at 7.45 a.m. and don't get back before 5.30 or 6 p.m. That's the reason I called Mr. Kensetter last night. You were already off duty. I only asked Mr. Kensetter if he could do anything about those little bars of soap. <laughs> I did not want a new maid. The new maid you assigned me must have thought I was a new check-in today. <laughs> because she left another three bars of hotel soap in my medicine cabinet along with her regular delivery of three bars on the bathroom shelf. In just five days here, I've accumulated 24 little bars of soap. <laughs> I'm beginning to dread the next nine days. Why are you doing this to me? Dear Mr. Berman, your maid Kathy has been instructed to stop delivering soap to your room and remove the extra soap. If I can be of any further assistance, please call extension 1108 between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. <laughs> Thank you, Elaine Carmen, housekeeper. Dear Mr. Kensetter, my backside dial is missing. <laughs> Every bar of soap was taken from my room, <laughs> including my own bath size diet. I came in late last night and had to call the bellhop to bring me a bar of soap so I could take a shower. He brought me four little cashmere bouquets. Dear Mr. Berman, I have informed our housekeeper, Elaine Carmen, of your soap problem. <laughs> I cannot understand why there was no soap in your room. <laughs> Since our maids are instructed to leave three bars of soap each time they service a room, the situation will be rectified immediately. Please accept my apologies for the inconvenience. If you prefer cashmere bouquet to came, please contact Mrs. Carmen on extension 1108. Thank you. Dear Mrs. Turner, who the hell left 54 little bars of soap in my room? I came in late last night and found 54 little bars of soap. I don't want 54 little bars of camera. I want my one damn bar of bat sized dial. Do you realize I have 58 bars of soap in here? All I want is my bath size dial. Give me back my bath size dial. <laughs> Dear Mr. Berman, you complained of too much soap in your room, so I had them removed. Then you complained to Mr. Kenstetter that all of your soaps were missing, so I personally returned them. The 24 camas which had been taken and the three camas you are supposed to receive daily. I don't know anything about the four cashmere bouquets. <laughs> Obviously, your maid Kathy did not know I had returned your soap, so she also brought 24 camas, <laughs> plus the three daily camas. I don't know where you got the idea that this hotel issues bath size dials. <laughs> I was able to locate some hotel size bath size ivory, which I left in your room. We are doing our best here to satisfy you. <laughs> Dear Mrs. Carmen, just a short note to bring you up to date on my latest soap inventory. As of today, I possess on shelf under medicine cabinet 18 came and four stacks of four and one stack of four. On Kleenex dispenser 11 came and two stacks of four and one stack of two. On bedroom dresser, one stack of three casual bouquets. One stack of four hotel size bath size ivory. Eight came and two stacks of four. Inside medicine cabinet, 14 came and three stacks of four and one stack of two. In shower soap dish, six came, very moist. <laughs> On the northeast corner of tub, one casual case slightly used. 
a northeast corner, northwest corner of the dub, six keme and two stacks of three. Please ask Kathy when she serves with my room to make sure the stacks are neatly piled and dusted. <laughs> So please advise her that stacks of more than four have a tendency to tip. <laughs> May I suggest my bedroom window is still not in use <laughs> and will make an excellent spot for future soap delivery. <laughs> One more item. I have purchased another bar of that size dial, which I am keeping in the hotel vault in order to avoid <laughs> misunderstandings as per. Now for the long drawn out one. <laughs> you will probably fall asleep. And uh, I, I say this, this marvelous young woman who talked about her red hair, and she had beautiful red hair. But it, 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 the red hair will pop up in the thing. I had no idea you were going to do that and ruin my routine. <laughs> It's going to happen here. It's called the insomniac soliloquy. You're the only one who's ever heard me. <laughs> At last, I'm all alone. Edith and the kids are away for the weekend and the whole place to myself. Two days off and not an obligation in the world. The end of a wonderful day, full of accomplishment, no true sense, nothing to reproach myself for, it is fantastic. I think I'll sleep until I wake up, that's all. I've done everything right tonight, I'm wearing cool, clean, crisp pajamas. In a cool, clean, crisp bed. I've read about a hundred pages of a cool, clean, crisp novel. At the first yawn of comfortable weariness, I closed the book, turned out the lights, and now I'm ready for sweet, restful sleep. Everything is at its place and all right with the world. For the first time in years, I'm in bed before midnight. It is wonderful. God bless Mommy and Daddy. And Edith and the kids and everybody in the whole world and my boss, Mr. Sloan. In that order. <laughs> and now to sleep. To sleep. Wonderful. To sleep. For chance to dream. I there's the rub. Rub. Rub a dub dub. Three men in a dub. Three men in a dub. Three men in one dub. With one secretary. And only two phones. Two phones for three men and one lousy secretary. Three men and one lousy overcrowded little cup and only two phones. George uses one of the phones for himself and Frank and I have to share the other. I wonder how come George has his own phone. I wonder if Mr. Sloan thinks George is more important than I am. Well, I'm certainly not going to lie here and worry about George all night, that's for sure. Okay, so he has his own phone, big deal. The night's night for sleep, not for worrying about George. I don't like George. <laughs> He's a nice guy, that redhead. Wow, has he got red hair. Oh, boy, this bed is comfortable. It's the best investment I ever made. All I want to do now is just plain sleep. Just plain sleep. I wonder why all redheads are left-handed. <laughs> ah, this feels good. This feels very, very good. Let me preface the whole thing by informing you I did not come into this office to tell you how to run your business, Mr. Sloan. I came in here only as a loyal and conscientious employee to ask how I can better serve this company, to inquire how I can help raise profits or lower costs, and to find out how come George has his own goddamn fault. <laughs> oh, well, I better not do that. I'll keep myself awake all night if I keep that up. Oh, no. From now on, I'll think about a thing, that's all. My mind is a complete blank. 
I am concentrating on only one thing, sleep. I am not thinking about a thing. And above all, I am not thinking about George and his goddamn phone. <laughs> there is no George and there is no phone. No phone for George to use to make personal calls from the office while Frank and I have to wait for each other to get off the phone in order to make a business call while that left-handed louse calls his wife, his in-laws, his spooky, how petty can you get? Ah, why should I care what he's got anyway? I've got, got all a man could ask for. I just go to sleep counting my blessings, that's all. Got my home, got my wife, got my kids. Got my home, got my wife. Got my kids. I got plenty of nothing. <laughs> and nothing, plenty for me. Jump, 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 jump. I got no misery. I got no lock on my door. That's no way to be. <laughs> what do they need a lock on that door for? And as long as they do have a lock, why shouldn't everybody in the office have his own key? And as long as they only have one key, why should the secretary keep it? Why should the only girl in the office have the key to that particular room? Dorothy, can I have the chime, a cat? Dorothy, can I have the key like a child asking for permission? That girl knows every single time I've gone to the toilet in the past four years. <laughs> I still disgusting even aggravate myself about it. So ridiculous to have a lock on that room. What would anybody want to steal from there? And even if they did, how could they get it down the elevator? <laughs> I'd better go to sleep. I'm getting silly here. I wonder why redheads always get sunburned. You never see a tan redhead. Because they're on the phone all day, they'll never get out their sun. <laughs> I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep myself awake forever if I keep this up. I've got to change this subject. I got, damn it, I've I got to think of something pleasant, something beautiful. Love. Love. Good. Think love. Oh, love is good. Love equals adore, equals worship, equals church, equals Sunday, equals picnic. Oh, this is good. Oh, this is a winner. Love equals adore, equals worship, equals church, equals Sunday, equals picnic. Equals flat tire. <laughs> equals the hottest August 15th in 25 years. Equals eat it if I told you once, I told you a thousand times, don't let the kids lean on the car while it's jacked up. <laughs> oh my God, what a mess. Oh, what a miserable day. What a day, what a day. Day after day after day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Friday, Saturday, Saturday, I'm having my breakdown tonight. I knew it was coming and it was coming. <laughs> holiday, holiday, holiday. Independence Day, Columbia Day, Memorial Day, Flag Day, Dennis Day, Doris Day. Oh, God. <laughs> they'll come, they'll take me away, I'll be screaming. Mayday. Mayday, Mayday. Payday. Payday, Payday. Birthday. Happy birthday, happy Mother's Day, happy Father's Day, happy Valentine's Day. Hello, Edith, I just called to wish you and the kids a happy Groundhog Day. Oh, my God, I'm in trouble tonight. I wonder what time it is. Oh, my goodness, it's ten minutes to seven already. Oh, for Pete's sake, I'm holding the clock upside down. It's twenty after one. I wonder why I can't sleep tonight. Because I've been lying here thinking that's why. And if somebody walked in right now and asked me what I've been thinking about for the last hour and 20 minutes, so help me, I couldn't tell him. Some basic issue was definitely bugging me, but that's for sure. But somewhere along the way, I've lost the thread. I've forgotten it. Isn't it? What? Something. I, I actually forgot what was bothering me. What a break. <laughs> Maybe now I'll slip. <laughs> I actually forgot what was bothering me. Damn it, what the hell was bothering me? <laughs> now I'll be awake all night trying to remember what was keeping me awake. 
All right, let's trace it down. Let's see now. The last thing I remember <laughs> thinking about was uh, groundhogs. Now, if I've been lying here in this bed for an hour and 20 minutes worrying about groundhogs, who the hell worries about a groundhog? What kind of an idiot would stay awake on account of a groundhog? Unless the damn thing were in bed with him. <laughs> Killed harmless little animals. Some had gray fur. Some had brown fur. I've even seen a few with red fur. <laughs> <laughs> Poor little things, they have it tough. Living in those tiny little holes. Chance to reason a groundhog wouldn't have an entire hole all to himself. Probably has to share the hole. With two or three other groundhogs. Imagine three adult groundhogs all working in one tiny little hole. Oh, and then in February, one of them gets to climb out of the hole and communicate with the outside world. It's always the one with the red fur. If he doesn't see his shadow, he stays out as long as he wants, enjoying free and unrestrained communication with the entire world, visiting other groundhog, saying hello, making personal calls on company time. <laughs> Edith, I've just written in my letter of resignation. Dear Mr. Sloan, after giving this matter careful consideration and examining every aspect of this issue objectively and unemotionally, I find it is not compatible with my best interest to continue working in the same tub with a left-handed groundhog. <laughs> Don't expect me to tell you his name. Let him call you up on his own goddamn private phone and tell you himself. I will not dwell on the other indignities I've been subjected to. Perhaps you might consult our secretary. She has the key to the whole thing. <laughs> my phone is ringing. What idiot is calling me up in the middle of the night? Hello? Who's there? George, hi there. How come you're calling me up in the middle of the night? Really? You know something? Me too. I've been tossing here for over an hour. Where are you calling from? The office? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm sorry. No, no. I, just, I wasn't thinking. I, I don't know. For some reason or other, I just didn't think you made personal calls from your home. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> what's, the, what's, the, what's the trouble, George? How come you can't sleep? Which one? No, I know that there's always been that uh, that one on my desk, and then there's a... No, no, there's always been that calculator on my desk, and then there's the other calculator on the table near the wall, so naturally, I always use the one on my desk, and you and Frank always share the one on the table near the wall. No, 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 Mr. Sloan never said it was my own private calculator. <laughs> George, that's ridiculous. He doesn't think I'm more important than you. What a silly thing to worry about. Is that what's been keeping you awake? Well, all I can say is you ought to be ashamed of yourself. It's so ridiculous for a grown man to be so insecure. This isn't the kind of thinking you'd expect from a mature man. You expect this sort of thing from a groundhog. A child, a child. <laughs> a child. Feel better now? Okay, Lefty. <laughs> Have a nice weekend. See you Monday in the tub. <laughs>